continent, INSEAD, Endeavor, student and alumni organization is all about sustainability, fostering sustainability, human, um, environmental. And we now collaborate, and this, is a, this, this event is a production of a collaboration of other clubs that also care about these things. One is the Community Impact Challenge, and they're formalizing their partnership with us so that we will have an action arm. They create an action item agenda for individuals uh, to change the way they live and they work, um, how we eat, how we eat, how we go and move about. Um, and then we're also combining forces with the Global Energy Club today who care tremendously about climate action. So if you're one of those three clubs, could you just raise your hands? All right. And I wanna just do a special shout out to Gabby from the UK version of Endeavor. She's the UK, who, who did a lot of promotion for us. And also to Bain and Company, because we would not be here but for their generosity. So Bain yeah. has hosted this for us. Bain is personified by Bianca sitting at the back and Fabio here at the front. They have been the arms and legs that have done all the tech and thinking and planning for us. And the other person that has um, is just been fundamental to us putting this on today is Nicole Harari, who's our Endeavor admin in Brazil. And she's on the screen. So she sees us. So please give a wave to Nicole. We wouldn't be here without her. There are many other fans that have helped, um, and I'm sure you'll get to meet them over the break, but I just want to make sure we don't miss those thank yous right in front of it. With that, Patel, I'm going to hand it over to you. The first session is on rethinking food as we refuel or as we think about fueling our future. And then the second session, as many of you know, will be rethinking energy. Patel. I'll be doing, by the way, if you're online, this is a hybrid event. There's three, two times as many people online as in the room. I will be monitoring the chat and I'll feed chat questions into the Q&A. But this is going to be about half presentation, half Q&A. So get your questions ready. Thanks. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm here with the author and superstar of this book, which pretty much summarizes uh, all the complexity of the food system, all the problems that come from the food system, and some of the solutions. And we want to hear about this today. You started, no, you didn't start your career at Bain, because you started as a journalist, I think. But you worked here as a consultant, strategy consultant for seven years or something like that. I started out as a chef, and then I was a journalist. Yeah. And then I joined Bain, and then I set up Leon. My, my career is a kind of, I'm like a, a, a drunk at, at night, <laughs> diving from bar to bar, whatever I felt like. It's a bit of a random walk. But yes, I was here for quite a long period. And, but you're mostly known for co-founding Leon, Leon restaurants. Everybody's familiar with that. I just had lunch there, actually, down the street. Did right? Because I, yeah, <laughs> but I brought my, uh, my plastic fork back to you, just in case you can still do something. I can't. <laughs> 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 we sold um, it uh, it's in sold, 2021, so it's not you, so in it's not you so anymore. It can't be held to account. Yes, but you know what it is, and you also know for an advocate of the in the food industry, you created the Sustainable Restaurant Association here to push for that. Then you tried to broaden that push with government, where you had some very concrete action. You did an uh, independent report on the school, uh, school food system yeah. that led to the universal free school meal for kids. Yep. Thank you for that. I think I think we should thank you for that. That's important. <laughs> and more recently, uh, you work with Defra as an advisor, where you led the same thing and uh, independent review with a lot of experts to look at the food system in the UK to design a national strategy. A few days ago, you designed from that. We're not going to talk about this now. We're going to keep that for after. <laughs> but uh, what you're going to talk about today? This book is basically the synthesis of that work that you've done uh, as part of uh, leading that. It's like hundreds of experts. And um, I think the best way to start is for you to give us like a quick summary of what's summary, in there. Okay. Ten minutes. I'll do that. I'll yeah. Do that. So thanks. So um, has any, first of all, uh, is anyone here in in the FMCG food? A few. Anyone in agriculture? Retailers? Anyone connected to food in any other way? Why we all? <laughs> 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 so, so um, the, the work that I was asked to do for the Department for Environment and Food and Rural Affairs, uh, which we call the National Food Strategy, was at a time we had left the European Union, and one of, if not the only thing that everyone could agree on in the UK was that we had the, the one opportunity it gave us was to reform. The way the common agricultural policy 
worked to actually change to create a form of farming that not only created food but restored the environment uh, and sequestered carbon and we could be much more radical on doing that and the department of environment food and rural affairs had been pushing very hard on that and everyone was saying well what about food what about health how does this what about food security how does this all fit together and so i was asked to do a piece of work on how you create a food system that produces enough food restores the environment doesn't make us sick and sequester and i, I had done um, as Cattell said i'd done a piece uh, a government review previously and so i kind of knew what to expect and you try to do two things i think when you're doing an independent review. has anyone done an independent review for government no, if you if you get asked to do it, it's a, it's a no, no. So it is an absolute nightmare. But you, because everyone on Twitter hates you, but you should you should do it because you have the opportunity, as Cattell said, to ring anyone in the world, the, the best brains on any topic, and get them on a conference call the next day. And that is about the greatest privilege that you can have as a human being. So I would strongly recommend it. And then they all endorse your books. You have all the stars yeah. here, right? So, <laughs> um, so but, but you, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to uh, change the way people understand the system. So Donella Meadows, who was part of uh, the MIT, original MIT team working on system dynamics, uh, they worked out the most, before you could change any system, you need to get people to understand how it actually works. And then you can intervene with policy. But until people understand how it works, you're not going to go anywhere. So part of your job is to change the way people think about the system. The other part of your job is to try and get policies, specific policies in place. And uh, we were relatively successful at that. So we got some policies on food poverty in place. Uh, a, a, a British footballer called Marcus Rashford uh, supported some of our ideas. We got some <laughs> recommendations on environment in place and a few recommendations on health in place. Um, but the book, no one sane downloads a government report and reads it for fun. <laughs> so uh, so the, the, the objective of the book is to take those ideas and to make them more uh, broadly spread, set the ideas free to change the way people think about the system. And I just want to talk about really the two fundamental ideas that are in the book. So, um, yeah, very nice day. <clears throat> Uh, everyone says when they when they see this, oh, that makes me want to buy a donut. So I know you have to actually been making it worse. So, so the food system we have today is a result of solving a problem in the past, which was at the end of the Second World War. Uh, we scientists thought the population was going to grow. In the past, we had always just simply as the population grew, dug up land to feed more people. There wasn't going to be enough land. We were all going to starve. It was one of the central concerns of mankind through the late 40s, early 50s. And along came Norman Borlaug, who was a, an American, young American botanist who had grown up during the Great Depression. He had seen starvation first, firsthand, had seen food riots, and he had decided that he wanted to help feed people. And he went to Mexico at the end of the war, and he managed to breed a new strain of wheat that was high yielding, uh, short stem, so it could support those high yielding heads and wheat, wheat rust resistant. And Mexico, when he arrived, was uh, massively um, importing over half its grain. By 1960s, it was self-sufficient thanks to his uh, new breed of wheat supported by um, industrial fertilizers and new irrigation techniques. And that progress spread across the world. Uh, we did it for rice, we did it for maize, and the population grew as expected, up to 8 billion. And we now produce off slightly less land than we did then 1.7 times the calories. There were just under 2 billion people on the planet then. It is one of the great success stories, came out as the Green Revolution of human history. Uh, as with a lot of great success stories, because it was preventing something bad from happening, it is, uh, you know, Norman Borlaug should be one of the great superstars of human, of human kind. No one, no one knows about him because all he did was stop disaster without anyone really noticing. But as often happens, when you change a system, you create other problems. And um, there are two problems in the food system that it has created. One is that the food that we eat has come to completely dominate the environment. So this chart shows on the left-hand side, 10,000 BC, the beginning of the Holocene, the beginning of that period of stable climate that enabled the development of human civilization because we could plan for harvest, we agriculture developed. Um, 
there were just over two million people on the planet and their weight was dwarfed by the population of wild animals, vertebrates, land running vertebrates and birds. Roll forward to today and you see the system as slightly, the, 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 the situation is slightly different. So wild animals have dwindled in the bottom right, first thanks to our um, enthusiastic hunting of megafauna um, a few thousand years ago and then uh, due to the farming system. Uh, people, obviously, we've expanded to 8 billion. Our pets, horses, cats and dogs weigh almost as much as all the wild animals put together. And the meat that we grow, the animals that we grow to eat, um, weigh twice as much at any one time as all humans and 20 times as much as all of the wild animals. And what this means is that the food system is by far the biggest contributor to the destruction of nature. It's the biggest um, cause, by far the biggest cause of biodiversity collapse the biggest cause of deforestation, it's the big cause, biggest cause of fresh water stress, it's the biggest cause of fresh water pollution, it's the biggest cause of the destruction of aquatic life, and after energy, it is the biggest cause of climate change. 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse gases are created by the food system. And actually, that means the food we eat is imperiling the way that we produce the food we eat. So the most frightening chart that we saw uh, uh, the whole time we worked was, was this chart here. It's actually been repeated by the UN, by NASA, by some British agencies, and they all came up with the same predictions. This is what will crop yields look like if climate change plays out as we expect it to play out. And the answer they all came up with was that in the Northern Hemisphere, wheat yields will increase because you have warmer climates and you have more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which encourages plants to grow. In the southern hemisphere, uh, maize, and, uh, and in the middle and the equatorial zones, maize and rice yields will decrease. That will happen both slowly, but also potentially quickly. So for example, the Mekong Delta is the biggest producer of exporter of rice to the world. If the sea level rises one meter, uh, over half the Mekong Delta will be underwater. Whenever we looked at this chart, we saw, um, warfare, mass migration. It's a very, very frightening chart. The other um, impact uh, uh, of the food system is our health. So this chart, just for uh, as an example, shows what we spend in the UK on confectionery on the right hand side, 3.9 billion pounds a year, and on fresh fruit and veg on the left hand side, 2.2 billion pounds a year. And we identified two things that were going wrong, two feedback loops that were changing. The fur that needed changing. The first was the junk food cycle. In the Western world, most people, particularly those who are suffering from ill health, and this is borne out by quantitative surveys, think that the problem is a collapse of willpower, a lack of exercise, i.e., if you are fat, if you are ill, it's your own fat fault for not having the willpower. This is categorically not true. 1% of people in the UK were obese in 1950, 28% of people are now. We haven't had it, we haven't genetically changed. The environment has changed and the environment has changed because of an interaction between our appetite, our evolved appetite, which evolved in a time where we were we were seeking out foods that were highly dense, uh, calorie dense. That's why honey tastes so good. It's why fat tastes so good, because it was rare. It was hard to get hold of, but it, 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 it paid back the calories it took you to, to, to gather it, to hunt it. And food companies, not because they're evil, not because they've woken up in the morning deciding we want to kill some children today, they have over the time <laughs> invested more and more money into those kinds of foods. 85% of the foods that FMCG companies produce uh, have been deemed by the World Health Organization to be too unhealthy to market to children. They've invested more, we've eaten more, they've invested more, we've got fat. It's a junk food cycle. It needs to be broken. You need to make it less commercially attractive for people to sell that food. And all of the CEOs behind the scenes of these companies will tell you that this is the case. The second um, uh, feedback that's gone wrong is what the uh, <coughs> British economist Partha Dasgupta in his brilliant report to the Treasury, the Economics of Biodiversity, called the invisibility of nature. So nature is not visible in any of the systems that we use to um, sorry that we use to measure human success. It's not in your wallet. It's not on the balance sheets of companies. Uh, it's not uh, in the way we measure GDP. And in fact, Dasgupta says, not only is it not there, we actually subsidize 
the destruction of nature to the court to the tune of about $500 billion a year worldwide in subsidies to industrial um, agriculture, fossil fuels, uh, and fishing. So we are actually giving nature a negative cost. We are paying people to destroy nature. And he estimated that cost was to the tune, the destruction to nature was about four to six trillion dollars a year. So once you understand that, the question then is, how do you fix it? And uh, on the health side, I think we have two routes that, that we can go. Uh, and I think the first route is more likely <laughs> because I think the political will here is very weak. So um, a lot of you will have heard recently about Wagovi, Azempic, appetite suppressing drugs. Uh, in the UK, it, the NICE, we can now prescribe them on the NHS. They are very effective, appetite suppressing drugs. And there is one future where instead of it, it, the junk food cycle is an interaction between your appetite and the commercial incentives and companies. Instead of improving the food system, you can actually change the appetite. And I genuinely believe that you will that, that probably the 50% prob probability is that 20 million people in five years' time in the UK are permanently medicated to protect their appetite from the food system. For them. Uh, the NHS, the NHS recently, uh, our current health service, um, the secretary asked his civil servants to look at the cost of putting 10 billion people, 10 million people on the NHS onto these drugs. The problem with that, they are actually incredibly effective. If you know people who have really struggled with a weight, who are unhealthy over BMI of 35, they are a very effective cure, but there are, you are storing up so many problems for the future, in my view, if you go that way. The other way is that you do things which can be politically unpopular, although actually citizens love them, funny enough, we did a lot of work on this, you can restrict advertising, you can put in taxes, you can try and shift the food system in the other direction. On the environmental side, you need to change the common agriculture product effective. It's actually a much easier transition to make. So you pay people for public goods, you pay people rather than for producing food, you pay them to restore biodiversity, you put in place regulation, you get your trade deals right. That is easier to do. So I'm much more optimistic actually on, the, on that transition than on the health transition. I'll just end by saying, um, that this machine that we are in uh, is a machine. Once you realize quite how much the planet is controlled by these feedback loops in the food system and that you are a tiny cog in them, it's quite frightening. But actually, as a cog, we can change the machine. And I think that in your businesses, uh, I think if you're a food business, it is much, there's a lot you can do to help people eat less meat, to support regenerative farming. There's a lot you can do without damaging your business model. I'm actually quite pessimistic on what you could do on health. I think it's very little, but you can do a lot by leaning into the environmental part and by just persuading your bosses, your leaders, not to lobby so hard as telling the whole world's gonna be a disaster if we try and improve the health side. Um, and then the other thing that you can do in your own personal lives is actually, we call it in the book, the power of love. Every good thing, I, I've done a lot of work in schools, improving school food, for example, which I set up a charity that did it. Every school you go to where the food is good, it's because one person decided to care. Every plate of food that was ever cooked for another human being was good, nutritious, delicious, was done because someone cared. So if you have a child, ask to go and see the food that's in their school. And if it's not good enough, agitate. Just look in your environment. It might even be in your own family, just deciding to eat a bit less meat. But just take one thing and go into your world at a bottom-up level. Change comes. Uh, you need government intervention to, to, to deal with externalities. It is necessary, but is not sufficient. And change, come, change comes with the combination of governments dealing with externalities and people at the bottom making the change from the bottom up. Thanks, Henry. Ten minutes. Good That's for you. Yeah. <laughs> So it's a, it's a good read because there are all these stories, these illustrations of how you know, what you can do as a person, you know, with this guy going yeah. to eat in his daughter's uh, school and then changing things from there. So I think it, it presents that well. But the main message is super important, I think. As you mentioned, the food system <coughs> is the number one cause of environmental degradation. Yes, clear, by far. By yeah. far. And the diet that we currently have, the poor diet we currently have, either by some people being obese, overfed, uh, and some underfed, is the number one cause of death and of driver to non-communicable uh, food uh, uh, diseases, non-communicable diseases worldwide. So it's not just a UK problem, 
if we fix food, we can fix the health uh, of people and of the planet. And that's the argument you're making. Mm -hmm. Now, what I like about the book, too, is that you debunk some of the myths that we see as the headline news. Huh? We just mentioned the one on the willpower, i.e., you know, just focus on losing weight and it will happen. Right. So there are others as well that you debunk there. For instance, one is um, that it is not that expensive to eat well. Right. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Because there is a huge inequality aspect to that. Problem. Yes. So, so the, 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 the harms are across society. People are suffering in every demographic, but they are visited in a much more concentrated fashion on though, the poorest in yeah. society. And we have one, one of the people who was uh, working with, with me on this was at the time the chief economic advisor to Rishi Sunak, our now prime minister, when he was our treasurer, our chancellor, a guy called Tim Lerling, very, very clever man. And he grew up, and we give an exa his example, but he right. grew up in poverty, very poor. And he gives an example of, he sent this long email about, you know, all the costs of things in the supermarkets. Now, actually, you can eat well on not very much money. The problem is that there are all sorts of other things that make yeah. that difficult. So, um, for example, if you're poor and you want to give your children, if you're, if you're living in poverty and you want to give your children good food, you worry much more about if they don't eat it. So you can't afford to buy them something else. So your default is to give them something that you know they will eat. Uh, many people in this country do not have a cooker, do not have a fridge, do not have a freezer. Uh, if you are tired and exhausted and stressed and ground down, then food can be one of the few sources of quick hit of pleasure you can have. And we go through in some detail. So although the, the fear, and actually there was an amazing woman called Davis. Yeah, Campbell. I liked her too. So da you. We, we had on our expert panel, it was brilliant actually. So on our expert panel, we had the ex CEO of Sainsbury's and the CEO of the biggest, uh, you know, um, vegetable producer of the UK and kind of eminent doctor. And then we also had some citizens, so some people who had lived in food poverty, etc. And Daisy, who we quote in detail in the book, right. completely, it's a really good example of how diversity works. So everyone is having their uh, business powered, INSEAD inspired strategic discussions. And then Daisy will go, actually, it doesn't work quite like that. And she actually knows, and it is really, you know, I, it was when I kind of saw the power of diver diversity of thinking and actually even getting kind of business people and doctors and into a room, it works. And she was incredible. She just like spells it out. So in the book, we put Tim's letter and then we have her. She wrote me an email. She wrote me an email to that book and said, Henry, what I want people to know is, and she just did this incredible. And she clearly like shows, because I wanted to highlight that inequality dimension, because that's very yeah. important in addressing it between countries, but also within countries like the UK. And she also yeah. says, it's not just a matter of cost. I'm having three jobs yeah. and I just don't have time to yeah. cook from scratch, right? Page 94, note it, read it. I mean, it's pretty powerful. <laughs> anyway, there, are another, uh, there, there is a range of myths like that that you debunk, like, you know, if you want to eat green, eat local, where you yeah. show that actually transport is only 17% of the greenhouse uh, gas emission of the whole uh, food system, yeah. while well, agriculture bears uh, 47%. Yeah. Sometimes it's greener to eat from far away if it's been yes. uh, farmed in a different way. Anyway, we could yeah. go on and on, but I think that's what's important. There is a lot of headline news on some of this problem that I think uh, needs to be clarified for everybody. Now let's talk solutions to this. Yes. Your book, because it was also commissioned by the government, focuses a lot on the government's so type of the solution. So we can go through that. You have a lot of talk here about removing subsidies, <coughs> adding taxes. You also show that doesn't work, not because it's not the right tool, but because there is no appetite for that. Why is that so? I mean, you try to add some taxes here in this country, meat, on salt, on sugar. Why is that not working? Why are those instruments not working from the policy perspective? So it's interesting. We ask the question in the book, what, what is government for? So free markets are incredible. They do, they, they give me things that government could not possibly give me. The planned economy has, has clearly failed. Um, so what, what are governments for? And, and the, the problem with free markets is that they do two things. They create inequality and they create dirt or externalities. So we argue that the job of government in regulating free markets is to try and uh, reduce inequality 
the natural separating of resources and to clean up dirt, so to deal with, uh, with externalities. So why don't they do that? The, the, the reason is that some of those externalities, they think they won't be able to do them and remain in power. So for example, if you were to put a carbon tax on meat per kilo, uh, it would be extraordinary at the current carbon price, it would be extraordinarily aggressive. So because it's per kilo, a fillet steak would go up by a little amount. Um, uh, beef mints would go up from four pounds a kilo to something like 11 pounds a kilo. Literally any government who did that would be out of power. Live reversed, it would be out of power in the week. There'd be mark on the streets. So some things are very difficult to do. And in fact, when Julian comes on next, if you look at the energy transition, they kind of, they didn't do that, yep. but they kind of were, they found different ways of walking down the cost curve with while just about keeping their electoral mandate. Then there are other times when they don't act. I think this is the case on health, when there are, there are ideologies and failures to understand how the system works, it means they don't act. So what I mean by that, when we put in place the, some measures on health that you could do, one was, a sugar and salt reformulation tax that's so similar to the sugary drinks thing but it works if you buy sugar or salt in very large bags uh, you have a tax and you have to reformulate it and it wouldn't actually put up the price of food very much but it would lead to reformulation in this country particularly but also across the world we have this phrase about the nanny state we were a we coined it i think the nanny state a lot of our leaders grew up with nannies uh, and, and they have an ambivalent view towards whether they love nanny or don't like nanny. But you get this massive culture war about, I'm not going to interfere in my citizens' lives. Whereas actually, whereas the government is frightened about dealing with meat, rightly so, we thought, we thought it was difficult for the government to deal with meat. But on the health things, they're completely out of step with the population. So we talk to people in the Red Wall, which is our, which is the area in the UK, which swung from Labour to the Conservative Party, enabled Boris Johnson to win this election. And everyone is terrified for the election coming out. Everyone's terrified about the Red Wall and what they're going to do about the Red Wall. The Red Wall voters are fed up with their children being bombarded with sugary drinks. They're fed up living in this system that's making it sick. And actually, I think what's stopping politicians there is a miscalculation of the, of the electoral calculus, not, not getting it right. But there are various different reasons. And, and actually, as you know, on the, we talked a bit about the policy mm -hmm. side. Yeah. If you kind of think of the tactics of getting policy into place, it's a very interesting dance. So you, you're telling the story, you're trying to change the way people think about it. But almost all policy uh, comes into place in a non-strategic way. So um, things ebb and flow. And as with the Marcus Rashford thing, there was a moment in October half term when pressure was put on the government and they suddenly did a whole bunch of stuff that people had been recommending for decades. So it is a weird, you know, politics is, um, you know, as you ever said, it's, a, it's, a, it's the worst possible way to rule a country except every other country. Democracy. Another solution you advocate for in the book is banning advertisement on certain yes. types of food, right? Yes. So can you tell a bit more about that? Well, so and banning advertising of junk food to kids and online. And funny enough, the, um, Someone, there was a serialization of the book in, in, in one of the newspapers, and someone sent me a snapshot of, of the serialization, and it was on banning advertising. There was the book in the middle, and all the way around the outside, there were kind of burgers and pizzas and chocolate bars <laughs> advertising. So, advertising is, is one. So, this is where government doesn't work because of lobbying. So, if you look at, uh, I talked about a, 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 a strong number 10 earlier on today. So. In the food system, you have every government department is responsible for different bits of it. And if you want to make long term systemic change, calculated change, you need a strong centre to bring that all together. So when the proposals to ban advertising were brought into place, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, they had had ITV come in, our independent television company, and say, A, advertising doesn't work, to write about the book, which is weird. <laughs> how come it supports Google and Facebook and everyone else? It doesn't work. A, advertising doesn't work. Uh, and B, uh, you'll destroy children's programming. And so 
the Department of Health is saying we need, we're dealing with too many sick people, the NHS is going to collapse. Culture is saying, no, 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 it's going to, it's going to kill children's programming, and it doesn't work anyway. And DEFRA is saying, uh, oh, we're worried about our food businesses because they're their clients. And so that was a, and, but then Boris Johnson, our prime minister during the, during the COVID period, almost died from COVID. He thought it was because of his diet. And he said, I'm going to do all this stuff and I'm, I'm going to do it. And it was on the cards and it was going to happen. And then again, the, the pressure comes in. So that was much more a lobbying pressure, that one, why that hasn't happened. That is, by the way, off the charts. It's 90% net promoter score if you talk about uh which i think means that 95 percent of the population thinks it's a good idea 95 so that is off the scales popular banning advertising for children and yet it still doesn't happen so if we move to what the private sector can do you're not covering that much in the book huh? uh what is the main recommendation that you support so I think that on, and I think the private sector is already doing this, on the environmental side of things, I think the private sector has huge power uh, to act, both through their supply chains, through their investment. Um, you know, very I was talking at a, a thing the other day, most uh, with um, private equity investors, and I kind of put up a hand about fundraising. Private equity, private equity funds are finding it really difficult to raise funds unless they can show that their businesses are behaving in a sustainable way. So I think there's huge power because there is a transition through now that doesn't mean destroying large, large parts of the economy or large businesses, not large parts of the economy, large businesses. And so if you were in a, actually a food business dealing with food, I think on the environmental side, the two biggest things you could do in the UK anyway, one would be getting people to eat less meat. I didn't, eating less meat is about land. It takes take 85% of the land, it's not about methane, it's about land. 85% of the land that feeds us is used either to raise animals or to feed crops to animals. And we just need some of that land back for biodiverse restoration and carbon sequestration. So there are, it's very easy for people to nudge their customers to eat less meat without upsetting the land with money. Obviously, uh, meat farmers find it challenging, but. You know, it's only 30% by 2030, maybe a little bit more. The other thing is the, the agricultural transition. So we have, our farmers have been doing what the government has told them for years. They dug up their fields during the war because they had to, they'd been basically paid to do what they do. And they have become quite they become quite fixed in that way. There was, a, there was an agriculture minister who went to a farm in the late 90s. He went to a farm in Cumbria. This is a story that's going to resonate with the English people in the room, but might not resonate with us. He went to a farm in Cumbria, and he said to the farmer, uh, what can I do for you? And the farmer said, he was a minister in the Department of Agriculture. The farmer said, you can make sure that my grandson farms this farm as I have farmed it. And the minister looked at him and said, that's very interesting because my grandfather was a miner. And so the mining in the UK had, during Thatcher years, had decimated. And so the point was, the government is not the government's job to look after you, it's the government's job to incentivize you to do the right things. And there are a lot of farmers who are scared. There is a huge potential in the transition, but they need support, they need help. So if you work directly in businesses that work with farmers, other than getting people to produce meat, I would either support organizations there's not nearly enough training and support for farmers so i would support organizations support them training mm -hmm. thanks let's meet and regenerative agriculture let's open for question online first yeah let's start with online so great transition from government to the individual and on the topic of meat eating um, we have a question from the um the virtual attendees around um, advice for meat eaters in a world that needs sustainability and particularly those from developing countries where protein is the way forward for health i mean getting a, a higher protein diet is, is critical uh so what was the question what what how does this affect developing so how can meat eaters um for, you know continue to eat meat oh, but perhaps switch the meats they eat i mean you may have some advice around that and then for the meat eaters that grows in developing countries where meat is actually the pathway to greater protein and health. What's your advice for that? So in terms of what meat, we were quite careful. So there, there's a phrase that a lot of people use, which is less but better. 
I think that is problematic because there are a lot of people who can't afford that. The idea that we can all eat <coughs> perfectly regenerated beef, etc. You know, if you are rich, then less but better is a good rule of thumb. But if you are not, just less because if you eat less chicken, you'll free up land from the feed, feed fed it, you'll clear up rivers. If you eat less pork, you will uh, reduce the animal cruelty, which is quite prevalent in, in pork. And you know, so less, I would say, in the developed world. In the um, in the developing world, it's a completely different problem. Actually, interestingly, in India and Brazil, they seem to be, and China, meat eating seems to have, if not peaked, it's slowing down. So it might be like like landlines and mobile phones. It might be that they they jump across to eating less meat um, and don't go through the incredibly heavy meat eating phase that we had. But that is, you know, in those in those countries, we on average each of us eats globally thirty five tons of food a year, uh, and, and Americans eat uh, about double that. So, um, you know, the English, marginal increases of meat in malnourished developing countries are not going to be the thing that destroys the environment. Yep. Thanks. Go ahead. You haven't touched on meat alternatives. I mean, you looked at the solution space for companies. What yes. about the whole alternative investment? Yes. Let's see. Is that okay? I'm going to take a couple of questions. Is okay. that okay? Yep. Yeah. And then I'll take it back. Go ahead. Oh. So um, you're talking about some of the economic factors that, uh, and other factors that um, um, incentivize or influence people on the choices that they make and what they put on. What about some of the non-economic choices, like for example, if we were to not look at those kinds of subsidies, but subsidies around health. I don't know, what if governments were to give everybody 20 bucks a month to go to the gym, would you not make better choices in what you eat and therefore you would deal with um, some, of, some of the sustainability issues because you would probably choose less meat and you probably eat healthier, so that's one from our virtual um, on, on consumer incentives to do the right thing versus disincentives to do the wrong thing. So I'll, I'll do the office first. So the, there's a chapter on the book called Goujons of Hope, which was in, 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 uh, impossible foods from the States sent me a two and a half kilo bag of uh, fake chicken goujons. And um, I fed them to my children. One at the time was vegetarian. One was a meat eater. Well, one was like a kind of uh, paleo, my 11-year-old uh, was like a kind of paleo hedge fund manager. He basically ate <laughs> meat and fruit. Nothing else. <laughs> and the other one was an omnivore. And um, they wolfed them down. Right? They said, it was, like, it was terrifying. They disappeared. And uh, I think that alternative protein is going to be a big part of the transition. There are people who say, with some justification, that they are ultra-processed and they are part of the problem. But we have two problems. We have two problems. We have one, we all should be eating lentils and chickpeas, mostly with a little bit of meat. We have, we eat 55% of the food we eat is ultra-processed. In my view, using the fact that that is the case to reduce the environmental harms is the right thing to do. You can't wait. It's going to be too late if you wait to shift everyone. I am a proponent of big proponents of different um, incentives. Yeah, different. different yeah, so, so different incentives. So, um, the the latest science is a, there's a thing called the doubly labelled water method, which you may or may not know. Of. Basically, it's very difficult to work out how much energy people burn. You have to put, you have to measure the amount of carbon dioxide that comes out versus the amount of energy uh, oxygen that goes in. That's the only way to measure it. And you normally had to do that with a, a hood on or you know, some kind of medieval torture device, but you could do it, but you couldn't do it. You couldn't measure the energy someone had burnt over a week. And then they developed a thing which has become much cheaper recently called the doubly labeled water method, where you uh, put, a, put in, in water, put some heavy hydrogen um, and some heavy oxygen. And because you only uh, the, the, the hydrogen you exhale as sweat and through your breath, but the oxygen only comes out through your mouth, you can actually tell exactly how much energy people have burnt over a period of time. And, and they've done this now with all sorts of apes, orangutan, etc., with humans, 
of all different sizes and shapes. And what they found was, surprisingly, that uh, sedentary people living in Chicago burned as much energy as hunter-gatherers. Uh, that people who did lots of exercise burn pretty much as much energy as people who are sedentary. And so exercise, this is over time. So for example, if you ran, they did an ultramarathon, and if you ran marathons every day, you started off burning a few hundred calories more every day, and it came down, came down, came down. Your body adjusts. So what your body, they think now happens, your body adjusts to exercise. So it helps you to lose weight in the short term, but over the long time, it's a lousy way, way to lose weight. And this is important because we tell people to lose weight by going to the gym and they go to the gym and they don't lose weight and they stop going to the gym. Going, exercising is the single most powerful thing they could be. So there's a big, all the science in the book, there's a big chapter in this. Yeah. So exercise is great, but not the solution. Um, but in terms of consumer incentives, a lot of people say, well, should we subsidize fruit and veg? Should we make it? cheaper the problem with that is it's incredibly expensive to do that you know, why would you subsidize my fruit and veg you know you're basically a national subsidy but we do say that you can incent consumers in two ways one is you can literally take money from the sugar and salt reformulation tax and subsidize you know, have um, free school meals have um, healthy start which gives families and properties free fruit and veg so you can do that kind of subsidy. But there are also quite interesting community initiatives. So in, in Washington, for example, they worked with people who were really struggling with their health. And they had a whole bunch of incentives, combined with cookery courses, combined with, it sounds incredibly paternalistic, but it worked. They're you know, walking around the supermarket helping people to shop. But I do think that, that that area is quite interesting, kind of how do you change behavior through incentives at community level. Sorry, if I just say yeah. Yeah. very quickly. Not exercise as a form, as a as an end goal to just lose weight, yes. but exercise as a way for a lifestyle change that will yes. actually help you make better yeah. choices, which will ultimately yeah. Yeah. keep people off. I'll think. I, I, I don't know if, if that. I, I haven't seen any evidence to show that if you incent people to exercise, they that they start eating better, etc. Et but if that was the case, it might well make sense. But you would want to find a way of targeting that um, uh, on people. Three on the well. side. Your first. Um, I, I have a question about the UK farming environment, because we know that there's a lot of an in initiative coming from the government for farmers to go more green. And those of um, them who have tried doing that have reported, yes, in terms of biodiversity, it can make a difference. But obviously, they're producing less than before or at a higher cost. And now, obviously, they ask a question about global competition. And the question is, should the government subsidize this in any way? Or what can we do in order to help them to move forward? Yeah, I subsidize about rich and yeah. ag, sir. Uh, it was a question about old proteins, but you spoke about it already. OK. Um, a quick question. Um, I work with a lot of financial institutions on. A bit louder. Yeah. Can you please see? Yeah. I work with a lot of financial institutions on target setting for agriculture. And it seems that you have a very intimate knowledge of the sector. What would be the three things you would recommend to banks in terms of how they engage with the agricultural sector to create incentives for them to transition to regenerative practices? What to incentivize, what to ban, to promote regenerative agriculture yes. and farming. If they go in the same direction. Okay, okay. Like plus, plus one, I was going to say plus one or regenerative agriculture from the virtual audience, specifically on grain monocultures and how we need to shift. So Let's take that as a batch. How do I'll we incentivize so, regenerative ag? So, so to start off by saying, what do you want your farming system to look like? And traditionally, there's been, there's been a battle between people who are what's called land sparing. And they are people who said, we'll have sustainable intensification. So we'll take those grain monocultures, we will double down on, on yields, we'll create more yields from them, but we'll do it in a sustainable way. So we'll work out ways of uh, working a bit with nature. So we don't, use much, um, we don't use much nitrogen, we don't use much pesticide, and we will create much more food from that bit of land. And that will spare other land to be returned to the wild. And um, the other argument is land sharing. So they say, no, that is wrong. That is going against nature. We need to go with nature. 
and we need to have regenerative rotations, we need to bring cattle back into the farm, we need to have nature on the farm. And the, 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 there's some really interesting experiments on what those two approaches do to wildlife. And what we, uh, the, the conclusion we drew was that actually for biodiversity in Western economies, as would apply to more countries in the UK, there is a whole ecosystem that has grown up on the on the land and therefore that form of regenerative farming moving towards slightly lower yielding farming is good for that ecosystem but if you make that the only form of land you take up too much land you can't produce enough food to feed it so you need to create what we call a three compartment model which is actually more of a continuum where you have some wild land some land which is farmed at lower yields but with more nature on the farm, and then some higher yielding land, but with but less destructively farmed. And you'll have a continuum. And you, if you reduce the amount of meat you eat, you can feed the world in that, in that way. The question then is how does the UK government subsidize that? And the answer is what they have got in place at the moment is right, but it's such a complex, so the, the, the framework is right. So the framework is, you, you pay people, instead of paying them to produce food, you pay them to uh, for public goods. So you pay them to prevent flooding, you pay them to restore biodiversity, you pay them to um, sequester carbon, quality. improve soil quality, etc. And then you regulate. That will go, the, the risk, there, there are two ways in which that can go wrong. One way is, which, which is happening, is that they won't get it right first. You know, it is difficult. They'll they'll have one kind of incentives. They won't have quite the right result. They'll have to do a bit trial and error, and trial and error is politically difficult. So, if there's too much error, it could become, it could get stopped politically. The other way it goes wrong is that um, uh, is that you get your trade deals wrong. So, if you are doing that with your farmers, and then you're letting uh, you then remove all your tariffs and let Brazilian beef come in, for example. Brazilian beef is about 70 kilos of carbon per kilo of beef versus ours, which is about uh, 35, uh, versus feedlot beef in America, which is about 25. One of the unfortunate things about feedlot beef is incredibly cruel, but no, no carbon. But anyway, so but if you allow, if you're trying to make that transition and you allow comp competition from farmers who are farming at lower standards, it becomes, it's pointless. You're basically just exporting the harms mm -hmm. elsewhere. And politically in this country, when we, when we went through Brexit, there were two fundamentally different types of Brexiteer. One, people who saw Brexit as being free market, ultra free market, and the other who saw it as being about protecting standards and moving away from what the EU was doing to do our own thing. And at the moment, we have a massive tussle over farming. because so obviously the latter group, it works because they want to restrict trade deals. The former group, it doesn't work. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. In terms of uh, what you can do if you're in finance and how you're incenting farmers, um, it's, a, it's a wild west out there at the moment. So um, they are, uh, you know, there's a lot of carbon being double counted on farms. There's no, there's no um, real proper audit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the people who are doing the best work on this are a group of supermarkets, farmers. And they're trying to create what they're calling the global farm metric. So they're trying to create a standard uh, for how you measure things. And they are connected to the green finance people. So the first thing I would do would be to go and talk to them. And I'm happy to put you in touch. But it is, uh, as you will know, if you're trying to do this, it is a, it's a really, there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And it's now starting also with nature. Uh, Last yeah. question. Yeah. So you were here? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank <laughs> you. One. Quick one. Uh, I'm from Brazil. Good that you mentioned all the Brazilian beef. Uh, Delicious. Just <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, but the point, the point is, uh, you, you make an argument about healthier, and healthier is not necessarily better in terms of carbon footprint. It depends very much on, on, on what to say, uh, what is uh, uh, sustainable. You know, this in Brazil, when we go organic or, or most of that stuff, you need much more land and much more water, you know, and much more labor to do it. Yes. So we must be careful. 
But my question is uh, concerned the trade-off between food and energy. You can uh, produce sugar cane, you can produce uh, corn, you know, and then make that into, into and alcohol. And use choices yeah, and trade-offs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so one of the, the central bank of, what, of our recommendations that got taken up was any country needs to do a land use framework. You have to you have to think you have to think the land is the scarcest of resources. That is the scarce resource, and so you need to look at, and, and in this country you wouldn't go all organic, but you would. We chopped out. You're rather unfair that we chopped down our rainforests. Uh, 600 years ago, so, uh, but you haven't. So you, you have to work, you literally have to solve the sum of how do we get enough energy, food, biodiversity and carbon using the land we have. And then you have to, uh, which no country does properly, is regulate against that land use framework. My strong suspicion is in that case, in that situation, uh, that um, uh, fuel <coughs> crops, are an absolute disaster, mm -hmm. and that they are embedded in the system through subsidies, and that the, the, the speed with which um, solar, in particular, is coming down will mean that we should move away from that. The problem is that there's a lot of face saving going on. We put a lot of money in, we force a lot of people to pay those costs. But my guess is that they will show to be a mistake in the, in the journey. But if solar, so the solar journey is just incredible. So it's, a, like, comple so it's a complex system, and I think that's the argument you're making, yeah. to look at it at the system view, otherwise you cannot solve these trade-offs. That's what's clearly argued here. Yeah. I need to wrap up, but you just resigned from uh, your position as an advisor to DEFRA a few days ago, so I need to ask you to close <laughs> because everybody wonders. So where are you going to go next to try to push the agenda if it's not with the government? Well, so I resigned because my permanent secretary is the, the head of the department in civil service. Hi. I was told I needed to to talk a bit more loudly, and she said, yeah. maybe it would be easier if you did that uh, outside. <laughs> <laughs> and I absolutely love her to bits. And so I said, you're absolutely right, so I resigned. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be doing two things. I'm going to be shouting about this book. Please, the most of this is ideas. Buy three copies and give them to three friends. Spread the other end, please. If you read it first, if you haven't bought a copy, <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. my wife, my wife is Jemima Lewis, and she's uh, who's so the, she's my a wife. Writer. She's a very good writer, so it is good. So please spread the idea. Separately, I'm doing. I'm, I'm we're expanding Chefs and Schools, which is the school yeah. charity, and I'm doing a bit of work with MNC Saatchi. They've decided to put all of their pro bono work into trying to create a campaign to eat less meat. And then on the other side, I'm trying to earn some money. I'm doing various bits of non-exact work. And for everybody here, going back to work on Monday, what's the one thing you want them to do on Monday? Buy on three Monday? copies of the book. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actions, at work. Actions at work. So yeah, I want you to sorry. think about or think about how in your work or in your community, it's not relevant. Yeah. What is the one thing that you could personally do, the cog in the machine to move right. the machine? That's what I do, and just commit to doing it. Okay. And buy three copies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We're going to leave it at that. I think I had uh, just my closing line that came from the book because I cannot find it. But anyway, let me see. I need to, I just need to see this. Sorry, all my notes. Yeah, we're now. If you're in any kind of position of power, use it wisely. And then you go through, you know, everything you can do in whatever sector you are. That's in there. Just read the book, but also change something. Thanks very much, Henry. Thank you very much. We're going to some reusable, recyclable swag. Oh, in excellent. NCAD. So nice. when you buy the book, you know, where you're touting the book, wear your NCAD t-shirt. Can, can, can I pretend <laughs> I went to business school? Yeah. <laughs> and his last point is where we're going to now move, which is what can each of us do to make a difference. And for that, we're going to see a video. And actually, we'd welcome you to stay in case yeah, it relates okay. a video um, from the CIC. So can I get Paolo up here? He's right here. OK, right. well, there he is. How about you sit here, Paolo? Is there anyone else from CIC that you want with you? This here? Hello, dear. There's another community impact challenge. We're going to watch a video I now I, about. I think it's all Ebru. Yeah. Ebru. OK, come on up, Ebru. I didn't know. Um, we're going to watch an amazing five-minute video on how um, 
the Community Impact Challenge, which is now really formally a collaborator with Endeavor, has created a platform for each of us to think about how we change things in our lives and at work. So let's, Fabio, if you can get the video. Sorry. As the climate crisis becomes increasingly evident, the call for action is also getting stronger. The Community Impact Challenge CIC, was started in December 2019 to create a ripple effect which will turn into big waves and make net zero possible. We mobilize the community by launching challenges. That's why we work closely with Endeavor, INSEED, the IAA and the Hoffman Global Institute for Business. CIC is run by the volunteers recruited from our alumni network and our supporters from around the world. Our very first challenge was the Single Use Plastic Challenge. Over 2,000 participants from 90 countries took part and together we managed to reduce an amazing 4,500 kilograms of plastics consumption. In 2020, we changed our focus to our food habits. We encouraged our participants to focus on the source of what we eat, reduce food waste and make more sustainable choices such as eat less meat. In this challenge, we achieved a significant reduction in red meat and dairy product consumption. Despite the success in our previous challenges, we recognized that organizations and businesses were the key sources of emissions. To achieve a bigger impact, in June 2021, we took the decision to launch a challenge that focuses on organizations and businesses, the Race to Zero Accelerator. Race to Zero is an initiative supported by the United Nations. We worked very closely with the organizer, we recruited a global team of facilitators and experts to help the businesses to sign up to the Race to Zero. Within a few months we managed to help more than 50 small businesses to commit, and with that in October we were recognized as one of the official Race to Zero accelerators. That was a very critical milestone of CIC. In the Race to Zero Accelerated Challenge, we saw that, while some organizations want to reduce their carbon emissions, their staff are not always ready. At the same time, while some individuals are keen to do something about the climate change, they don't always know where to start and find themselves the minority in their organizations. That's why we launched our latest challenge, Start Now. We target individuals in the organizations, giving them a free platform to learn about climate change, take actions to reduce carbon emissions, and connect with each other. In this challenge we target at least 2,000 participants. We want our participants to learn at their own pace and enjoy the process. We have sourced some high-quality content in user-friendly formats, covering different topics. To make your actions impactful, in our ACT module, we will suggest a small number of practical steps you can take to reduce carbon emissions. We are hosting the challenge on Guild the Social Platform app. It will take a few minutes to set up and it's free. Because we will have our private forum, our participants can share experience and ideas, encourage each other, and also share content and events. Behind the scene, we have buddies to look after our participants, moderators to keep the discussions going and a team of volunteers to answer our participants' questions. To sign up, it's very simple. Visit our website startnow.green. Complete our short form. Then set up Guild with the link we will email you. Once you are in, you will see other different groups outside Start Now you can request to join. A good opportunity to expand your network. Here is a quick recap. I did not mention it is only a 10-week challenge, we welcome alumni, colleagues, friends and family. And, it's free to join. Finally, we would like to invite the IAA and the NAAs to work with us in the Start Now Challenge. We believe our challenge will bring additional benefits. For example, we can help to reinforce the lifelong learning value proposition. 
Through working with us, you demonstrate your sustainability leadership actively. You can also offer your members a user-friendly option to start reducing their carbon emissions and be a true force for good. If you want to find out more about how we can work together, just reach out to one of us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about CIC and the Start Now Challenge. Now Paolo, one of our founders and our core team members who are here with us today, are ready to take any questions that you may have. questions for about five minutes, but I would love, there's 300 of us in the room and in the virtual room, and they're looking for 2,000 participants. So I would love for us to be in on the first 300 and tell us how we can do that. Okay, I didn't know that was sitting here today. <laughs> <laughs> I think the video said it all already. Um, I'd like to, to, to listen to your questions. Questions on getting. Has anyone done one of the CIC challenges? By the way, this is the 30th anniversary of Endeavor. It's the three year anniversary of CIC. Look at much, I mean, they've done so much in three years. I mean, just let's give you. Maybe, maybe I start with a question. So, someone wanted to ask to buy three books. I would like to know if we have a three national association that would like to join Start Now. Oh, three national associations. Okay, we have the US. We yes. have. Singapore, Singapore, Singapore Brazil. and Brazil. Thank you, thank you. You have another good question. That worked no, well. Now we listen to you. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Um, oh, yeah. You mentioned an app to download. Was it guild.co? Yeah. So people yeah. just go to guild.com? So maybe I collaborate. Uh, collaborate. Sorry, I elaborate about this. So we. This is the fourth challenge. We have mobilized, and I stress the, the word mobilize, um, thousands of people, I think 7,000 people over the three challenges, um, but always in a non-scalable way. And this time we're, doing, we're using an app to become more professional, especially more scalable, so that we continue, can continue over the next two years and uh, reach 30,000 people to do something in their office, to do some changing in the office, and. Uh, and some of them will, will join the race to zero and commit uh, net zero in their company. Now, um, we have chosen as a platform a guild, which is a community management platform. So it's all about community. And um, what I personally have learned is that we, you know, we can change to have any impact, but if we are alone, if we feel being alone, we have really difficult time to do the first steps. So being a community is about not feeling alone, feeling that if you do something, you do with others. So you're, you have a much bigger impact because you're not alone. You can collaborate to understand what is the best thing to do, to share with each other best practices, lesson learned, and values. So that's the reason why we choose Guild, which is a community management platform as a, as a digital platform. Time for one more question. One question here. Please. So, Paolo, for this challenge, what is the, what are the um, intended outcomes that you want? Um, we want to, to reduce. We wanted to unlock a huge ripple effect and reduce uh, uh, the carbon footprint of our participants and their communities by zillions of tons. Okay, but as a first KPI, in the next months we would like two thousand people to join our waves of uh, start now challenges. Um, and out of them, a small part, a smaller part, uh, I think a 10%, joined the race to zero. And then uh, BCG, sorry if I say, if I say BCG, I'm okay. uh, On the sustainability uh, part, we can say it. Uh, anyway, a consulting company will uh, come to the <laughs> unnamed. unnamed consulting company. Start unnamed with consulting company will calculate the footprint. <laughs> okay, that's perfect. Go ahead. Can can you hi Paul? Can you share like a success story of, of one community where you know the app was deployed and where you really had a lot of you know uh, following and 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 excitement and you know and success in terms of actually reducing all kinds of you know, climate impacts and 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 changes and changing in behaviors? Yeah, community challenge. That's the success story. No, but you mean in guild? Oh, a company, a company or community, or because if I understand well. 
uh, participated to a number of the uh, of the CICs, but a lot of them were targeting uh, people, mm. individual yeah. people. Now you're targeting I think corporations. So, yeah, I, I would also like to elaborate on on your question. So what often happens in companies is that individuals they have the passion and they have the drive and they want to do and make a change but they don't know where to start so that's the first thing um the company i work for we work with corporates and we also have an app system as not guild but where we realize there is when people walk alone they don't walk very far okay so the power of the community comes in here where we bring people together where they can motivate each other where they can learn from each other on Guild already, we have so many candidates or participants who are very experienced in sustainability. They either had their own sustainability journey, they're leading sustainability in their companies, or they come from a different aspect of sustainability. So these people can contribute with knowledge, with ideas, with best practices on how to go about in companies to reduce carbon emissions, be it now uh, turning down the heater, if that's possible, be it how to commute to work, be it how to, we were, we were talking about uh, what we can do on Monday, for instance, have a vegetarian lunch or make it a standard to have vegetarian lunch at work in order to reduce your meat consumption in general. So what we're trying to do with this new challenges is not just to bombard individuals with knowledge, but to make it easy to digest to give them first simple steps to get into sustainability as an individual at the workplace and to learn from each other, from the community, and to have also this feeling and not to walk alone in this journey. So you interact with people of that community, your community, not with everyone on the app or with people yes. that, you know. So Guild is open to anyone. This an open, CIC is an open community and we have already people joining from outside of the 7,500 community members we have, yes. So it's not limited to INSEAD or the people we directly reach. You can invite your community from Belgium. Katal can invite her community in France or the US. So it's absolutely open. And that brings, it enriches the community through the diversity. I'm going to suggest that we have a break coming up in about three minutes that Paolo, maybe you set up Guild on the computer up here. And if anyone wants to see like how you get on, you can just show them on your computer. So there, we'll have a little demo going right at the front. Uh, before the break and before we close out this first session, a couple announcements. One, if you were one of the first 50 to sign up for this meeting, you get a free book from Henry and your book is waiting for you down the hall where you came in, but turn to the right. There's a big table. It has your name on it. There's 30 books. And if you don't pick it up today, we're just going to give it to anybody who wants it because we don't have any, you know, mailing postage plan. Um, so please get your book if you ordered one. Second, one of the things Endeavor does is we offer webinars for lifelong learning in collaboration with um, the NCAT alumni and the lifelong learning program there. And we, we focus them on sustainability, both human sustainability and environmental sustainability. The next two happen to be related to food. One is coming out of Brazil. Antonio, you want to just say one thing about it? It's going to happen in June. Uh, what? Just stand up and just quick, quick in a PSA for your webinar. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, what we are planning, John, is to is to bring a social entrepreneur called the Dulira, and he's going to to speak about a program that we are uh, designing in Brazil, and it has the the, the ambition uh, to eliminate poverty in the world. You know, so basically, this guy is a guy who was born in a shanty town. He's a, a, he's a black. Uh, his father was in prison. Uh, he was listening shots all the time, and now he's he's engaging all the the, the community. He's engaging. Uh, even Mackenzie Bezos is giving money to him. So he tried that in four shanty towns. And uh, uh, the the idea is that now this goes to eleven thousand shanty towns in all across Brazil. So it's our idea is security to security and livelihood, right? That he's addressing. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. So the idea, the idea is to show this this program to the world. So this will be a case study for those of us working in other parts of the world that want to address food security and livelihood. Mm -hmm. Don't miss that. There'll be, you know, by the way, as part of your um, at registration, you automatically get put on the Endeavor mailing list, so you will get a notice of this. 
Um, the second one is from Robin. Is she in the room? Robin, yes. Hi. Can you tell us this is going to be in September? We just launched, Stand up, Robin. Right, we just launched what we call the Finance uh, Markets Roadmap for Food System Transformation. It's uh, going to be on our website on Monday. It's 145 pages. If you're a sell side, buy side analyst or anybody who has that kind of financial orientation, we've gone through what we think are the key points in the food system issues. And we will give you a presentation and I think updates by September. And your organization? Planet Tracker, if anybody knows Planet Tracker or Carbon Tracker, we're financial to London, we believe funded financial think tank. So. Great. So, uh Tom DeLay, who came early, sitting over here from the Carbon Trust, he will be joining Julian Critchlow at 345 Sharp back here for the next session. Please be back here by 340 so that we can have a quick start. We will have to be out of the room right at 5. Um, meanwhile, talk to Tom. Oh, here's Julian. Here's Julian, our other. Our other. Come on in. Woo! Woo! Julian and Tom will be our um, rethinking energy panel with um, with um, Ramji over here um, interviewing them. So come back right at 3:40, please. And meanwhile, there's coffee, um, there's biscuits, and there are books for 30 of you. So don't miss them. Take care. <laughs>